Lily had always been fascinated by antiques. As a child, she would spend hours wandering through old shops with her grandmother, admiring the aged furniture, porcelain dishes, and the array of old, forgotten dolls that filled dusty shelves. Her grandmother had been a collector, with a special love for dolls, delicate, hand-painted porcelain faces that gazed blankly from their wooden chairs, frozen in time. When Lily's grandmother passed away, she left Lily her entire collection of antique dolls, along with the family home where she had lived for nearly seventy years. The house itself was a sprawling Victorian manor, tucked away in a quiet rural town. It was a place of childhood memories for Lily, filled with the smell of old books, the creak of wooden floors, and the low hum of the grandfather clock that stood in the hallway. But it had also always felt a little eerie, especially at night when the wind howled through the trees and the dolls seemed to watch from every corner. After her grandmother's death, Lily decided to move into the old house. It felt right, as if she was keeping a part of her grandmother's memory alive. She spent weeks cleaning and organizing the rooms, but no matter how much work she did, the dolls remained a constant, unsettling presence. Her grandmother had displayed them in every room, rows upon rows of porcelain faces, some smiling, others with expressions too neutral to feel friendly. They filled the shelves, sat on chairs, and even lined the staircase in neat little rows. At first, Lily told herself that it was just her imagination. After all, she had grown up around these dolls, they had been a fixture of her childhood. But now, living alone in the house, the stillness of the dolls unnerved her in a way it never had before. It wasn't long before she began to notice that things were off. It was the third night in the house when Lily first woke up to the sound of something moving. It was a soft sound, barely perceptible, but enough to rouse her from sleep. She lay still, her heart pounding in her chest, listening intently. For a moment, there was only silence. Then, there it was again, a soft click followed by a faint scraping noise, as though something was shifting across the wooden floor. Lily sat up, her eyes adjusting to the darkness. The room was bathed in moonlight, casting long shadows across the floor. She glanced around but saw nothing out of place. The dolls on the shelves sat as they always had, their empty eyes staring back at her. But the uneasy feeling in her chest wouldn't go away. She lay back down, pulling the covers up to her chin. It's just the house settling, she told herself. Old houses make noises. But that night, sleep did not come easily. Every creak of the floorboards, every rustle of the curtains sent her heart racing. By morning, she was exhausted, her mind filled with images of those lifeless porcelain faces watching her as she slept. Days passed, and Lily tried to ignore the strange feeling that had settled over the house. She busied herself with unpacking, filling the old kitchen cabinets with dishes and arranging her grandmother's collection of books in the library. But no matter where she went, the dolls were always there, their glassy eyes following her every move. It wasn't until a week later that things escalated. Lily had spent the afternoon cleaning the sitting room, dusting the old furniture and wiping down the shelves where the dolls sat. One of the larger dolls, a blonde-haired figure in a pale blue dress, had always sat on a rocking chair near the window. Lily had vivid memories of playing with the doll as a child, brushing its hair and adjusting its dress. It had always been her favorite. As she finished cleaning, Lily glanced over at the doll. It looked exactly as she remembered, with its bright blue eyes and soft, curly hair. She smiled to herself and moved on to the next room. That night, as she sat in bed reading, she felt a strange compulsion to check the sitting room. It was an odd feeling, one she couldn't shake, as if something was calling her. Reluctantly, she set her book down and crept downstairs. The house was silent as she made her way to the sitting room, her bare feet padding softly on the wooden floor. She pushed open the door, her eyes immediately drawn to the rocking chair. 
her blood ran cold. The doll was no longer sitting in the chair. Lily stood frozen in the doorway, her heart pounding in her chest. The rocking chair was empty, slowly swaying back and forth as though something had just moved from it. She looked around the room, her breath catching in her throat. There, in the far corner of the room, the doll sat on the floor, its legs splayed awkwardly as if it had been dropped. That's impossible, she thought, her mind racing. I didn't move it. No one else is here. Trembling, Lily approached the doll. Its head lolled to the side, those same blue eyes staring up at her, unblinking. For a moment, she considered picking it up, but a deep sense of dread stopped her. Instead, she backed out of the room, shutting the door behind her, and ran upstairs to her bedroom. That night, sleep eluded her again, the image of the doll burned into her mind. The next morning, Lily tried to rationalize what had happened. Maybe she had knocked the doll over while cleaning and hadn't noticed. Maybe the wind had blown it off the chair, though the window had been closed. She tried to push the incident out of her mind, but as the days passed, more strange things began to happen. Items around the house started going missing, small things at first, like her keys or a book she'd been reading. She would search the entire house only to find them in odd places, as if someone, or something, had moved them. A creeping sense of unease settled over her, and she found herself avoiding the sitting room altogether, unwilling to face the doll again. Then came the whispering. It started late one night, just as she was drifting off to sleep. At first, it was so faint that she thought she was imagining it, soft, indecipherable voices coming from somewhere inside the house. She lay still, straining to listen, but the voices faded away before she could make out any words. The next night, the whispering returned, louder this time. It seemed to come from the hallway outside her bedroom, a low, murmuring sound that grew more insistent, as the minutes passed. Lily's heart raced as she pulled the covers up over her head, trying to block out the sound, but it was relentless. It was the third night when she finally worked up the courage to investigate. Armed with a flashlight, she crept out of bed and into the hallway. The house was dark and cold, the air thick with tension. The whispering grew louder as she approached the stairs, and her breath hitched as she realized the sound was coming from the sitting room. She descended the stairs, slowly, her pulse quickening with every step. The whispering was now unmistakable, soft, childlike voices, as though a group of people were murmuring just behind the closed door. But the words were distorted, too faint to understand. Taking a deep breath, Lily pushed open the door to the sitting room. The whispering stopped instantly. The room was exactly as it had been before, quiet, still, and filled with dolls. The rocking chair was empty, the doll in the blue dress sitting where she had left it the day before. But something felt different. The air was thick with an oppressive presence, and the dolls seemed to be watching her more intently than ever. Lily stood in the doorway, trembling, her flashlight beam dancing across the rows of porcelain faces. And then she saw it. One of the dolls, smaller than the others, with black hair and a frilly white dress, was standing. Not sitting on the shelf where it had been earlier, but standing upright in the middle of the room, as if it had moved on its own. Lily's breath caught in her throat, and she backed away, her hand shaking as she pulled the door shut. Desperate for answers, Lily began to dig through her grandmother's old belongings, searching for anything that could explain the strange occurrences. In the attic, she found an old trunk filled with letters, photos, and handwritten notes, her grandmother's records of the doll collection. One letter, dated over fifty years ago, stood out from the rest. It was from a man named Elias Thorne, a doll maker who had lived in the town many decades ago. The letter was written in a hurried, almost frantic hand, warning Lily's grandmother about the dangers of his creations. 
The dolls are cursed, the letter read. I didn't mean for it to happen, but there is something inside them. Something evil. They whisper to me at night, telling me things I don't want to hear. I can't stop them. I've tried to destroy them, but they always return. Please, if you receive this letter, destroy the dolls. Burn them. They must not be allowed to exist. Lily's hands trembled as she read the letter. The doll maker had been right, there was something wrong with the dolls. And now that curse had passed on to her? That night, the whispering returned, louder and more insistent than ever. The dolls had begun moving on their own, sometimes they would be in different rooms, other times their heads would be turned to face her when she knew she hadn't touched them. The house was alive with their presence, and Lily could feel them watching her, their cold, glassy eyes following her every move. Lily knew she had to do something. The dolls couldn't stay in the house, not if they were cursed, not if they were dangerous. She decided that the only way to free herself from the haunting was to follow the dollmaker's advice, she would burn them, destroy them all before it was too late. In the dead of night, she gathered every doll in the house, piling them into a large wooden crate. Their lifeless faces stared up at her as she worked, their expressions frozen in unsettling neutrality. The last doll she picked up was the one in the blue dress, the one that had once been her favorite. Its eyes seemed to gleam in the dim light, and for a moment, she swore it smiled at her. Ignoring the chill that ran down her spine, Lily carried the crate outside to the fire pit in the backyard. She doused the dolls in gasoline, her hands trembling as she struck a match and threw it into the pit. The fire roared to life, the flames licking at the porcelain faces, blackening the delicate dresses. For a moment, Lily felt a surge of relief. It was over. The dolls were gone. But as the flames grew higher, a scream tore through the air, a high-pitched, inhuman wail that sent a wave of terror crashing over her. The fire blazed brighter, and through the flames, she saw them, figures, ghostly and twisted, rising from the burning dolls. Their faces were distorted, their mouths open in silent screams. The dolls weren't just haunted, they had been vessels for something far worse. The shadows whirled around Lily, the whispering voices louder than ever, filling her mind with incomprehensible words. She stumbled back, her vision blurring as the figures closed in, their cold, bony hands reaching for her. You shouldn't have burned us, the voices hissed. Now you belong to us? Lily tried to scream, but no sound escaped her lips. The shadows enveloped her, and the last thing she saw before everything went dark was the doll in the blue dress, standing at the edge of the fire pit, its porcelain face still intact, its eyes gleaming with malice. The house stood empty for months after Lily's disappearance, abandoned and forgotten by the townspeople. No one knew what had happened to her, but rumors spread about the strange occurrences at the old Victorian manor. Eventually, the house was put up for sale, and a young couple bought it, eager to start a new life in the quiet rural town. As they moved in, they discovered an old doll in the attic, a beautiful porcelain figure with curly blonde hair and a pale blue dress. The doll seemed to watch them with its glassy blue eyes, but the couple thought nothing of it. They placed the doll on a shelf in the living room, unaware of the curse that lingered within it. And as the first night fell over the house, the whispering began again. Because the dolls never forget. Samantha Moore had never been to a place quite like Ashgrove Manor. The massive estate sat on the outskirts of a small town, surrounded by dense woods that seemed to stretch for miles. The house itself was imposing, with tall windows that reflected the late afternoon sun and ivy crawling up its weathered stone walls. Samantha had inherited the manor from a distant relative, a great-aunt she had never known. The estate had been left to her out of the blue, following the passing of her aunt, Isabel Mott, who had been a recluse for most of her life. 
Samantha hadn't even known she had a great aunt until the lawyer called her. Apparently, Isabel had lived alone in the manor for decades, rarely seen by the townsfolk. Rumors swirled around her, stories of a strange woman who never left her house, consumed by her peculiar hobby, crafting dolls. Samantha wasn't particularly interested in dolls, but she was curious about the inheritance. She needed the money, and selling the house seemed like a good option. After all, who wouldn't want to get rid of a creepy old mansion in the middle of nowhere? As she stepped out of the car and approached the front door, Samantha felt a chill in the air, even though it was a warm day. The house loomed over her, its windows like eyes watching her every move. She pushed open the heavy oak door, which creaked loudly as it swung inward, revealing a grand foyer bathed in dust and shadow. The interior of the house was just as unsettling as the exterior. Dusty furniture sat in silent rooms, and cobwebs hung from the corners like tattered curtains. The air was thick with the smell of age and decay, and the creak of the floorboards echoed through the empty halls. But what caught Samantha's attention immediately were the dolls. They were everywhere, lining shelves, sitting on tables, perched in chairs, and even peeking out from behind the curtains. Hundreds of them, all meticulously crafted and eerily lifelike. Their glass eyes seemed to follow her as she walked through the house, their painted smiles frozen in place, as if they were waiting for something. Samantha shuddered. She wasn't a fan of dolls, especially ones as creepy as these. But she pushed her unease aside and began exploring the house, searching for anything of value or personal significance that might explain why she had been left this strange inheritance. As Samantha wandered through the house, she couldn't shake the feeling that she was being watched. The dolls seemed to be everywhere, no matter which room she entered. Some were small, the size of a teacup, while others were nearly life-sized. Each one was unique, dressed in old-fashioned clothing, with carefully painted faces that seemed too real. In the study, she found a large oak desk, covered in papers and old, leather-bound journals. Most of the entries were in her Aunt Isabel's handwriting, detailing her life in the manor. Isabel had been a doll maker, crafting dolls by hand for most of her life. She had sold them at one point, but as the years passed, her work became more intricate, more obsessive. One entry caught Samantha's eye. The dolls are my companions now. They are more than just toys, more than just creations. I have given them life in my own way. They watch over me, protect me. But there are those that whisper in the dark, those who do not sleep. Samantha frowned, feeling a shiver run down her spine. What did Isabel mean by whisper in the dark? She flipped through more pages, but the entries became increasingly erratic, filled with fragmented thoughts and cryptic phrases. The whispers? They grow louder. They want something from me, something I cannot give. I must not leave them alone for too long. They grow restless when they are ignored. I fear what they will do when I am gone. Samantha slammed the journal shut, her heart racing. Her aunt had clearly been losing her mind. But as she looked around the room, at the rows of dolls sitting silently on the shelves, she couldn't shake the feeling that there was something more to this. Something Isabel had been afraid of. That night, Samantha decided to stay in the house. She wasn't afraid, at least, that's what she kept telling herself. The house was eerie, sure, but it was just an old building filled with old things. Nothing more. She sat up in one of the bedrooms, avoiding the rooms that were packed with dolls. She tried to settle in, but the oppressive silence of the house made it difficult to relax. As she lay in bed, Staring up at the ceiling, she heard it, a soft scraping sound, like something small being dragged across the floor. She sat up, listening intently, but the noise stopped. For a few moments, there was only silence. Then it came again, 
a faint shuffling, followed by a series of soft taps, like footsteps. But the steps were too light, too small to be human. Samantha's heart pounded in her chest. She got out of bed, grabbed a flashlight, and crept toward the door. The house was dark, the only light coming from the moon outside. She stepped into the hallway, her hands trembling as she shined the light around. The dolls were still there, sitting in their places, their glass eyes reflecting the beam of her flashlight. But something was different. One of the dolls, a small, porcelain one dressed in a white lace gown, had been sitting on a chair near the end of the hall earlier that day. Now, it was on the floor, lying face down. Samantha swallowed hard. She hadn't knocked it over, she was sure of that. Had she? Maybe she just hadn't noticed it before. She picked the doll up and placed it back on the chair, her fingers trembling as they brushed against the cold porcelain. She tried to convince herself it was just her imagination. The house was old, full of strange noises. That's all it was. But as she turned to go back to bed, she heard it again, this time, louder. A distinct scraping sound, like something heavy being dragged across the floor, followed by a soft, whispering giggle. Samantha froze, her blood running cold. The sound wasn't coming from the hallway. It was coming from downstairs. Unable to sleep, Samantha decided to investigate the sound. Gripping her flashlight tightly, she made her way down the creaky staircase, her footsteps barely audible over the pounding of her heart. She followed the sound to the back of the house, where she found a door she hadn't noticed before. It led down to a basement. The air in the basement was musty, and the stairs creaked with every step. As she reached the bottom, the beam of her flashlight illuminated an old workshop. The walls were lined with shelves, filled with more dolls in various stages of completion. Some were missing limbs, others had no faces yet. Tools lay scattered across the workbench, and in the center of the room was a large, ornate dollhouse. The dollhouse was a perfect replica of Ashgrove Manor, down to the smallest detail. Samantha couldn't help but feel drawn to it. She knelt in front of it, carefully opening the tiny front door. Inside, she found miniature versions of the rooms in the house, each furnished with tiny furniture and, of course, tiny dolls. But as she looked closer, she realized something that made her stomach turn. In the dollhouse, in the miniature replica of the room she had been sleeping in, there was a doll that looked just like her. Its tiny eyes were painted open, its face turned toward the miniature bed. Suddenly, the sound of footsteps echoed from behind her, followed by a soft, childlike giggle. Samantha jumped to her feet, spinning around, but there was no one there. Just the rows of dolls, watching her silently from their shelves. Her flashlight flickered, and in that brief moment of darkness, she heard the unmistakable sound of something moving, something small, skittering across the floor. When the light returned, one of the dolls from the shelf had moved. It was standing now, in the middle of the room, its head tilted to one side as if watching her. Samantha backed away, her breath coming in short, panicked gasps. She had to get out of the house. She had to leave now. Samantha bolted from the basement, slamming the door behind her as she raced back up the stairs. The house felt different now, darker, more alive. The dolls seemed to be watching her every move, their glass eyes following her as she ran through the halls. But it wasn't just the dolls. The entire house felt like it was closing in on her, the walls pressing tighter, the air growing colder. She could hear the whispers now, soft, incoherent voices that seemed to come from everywhere at once, calling her name, mocking her fear. The front door was just ahead. Samantha lunged for it, but before she could reach it, the lights flickered out completely, plunging the house into darkness. She froze, her hand on the doorknob, too terrified to move. 
the whispers grew louder, and she felt a cold breath on the back of her neck. Slowly, she turned, her flashlight barely illuminating the space behind her. The dolls were moving, slowly, silently, stepping off their shelves and creeping toward her. Their glass eyes glinted in the dim light, their painted smiles twisted into something far more sinister. Samantha fumbled with the door, but it wouldn't budge. It was as if the house itself was keeping her trapped. The dolls were closer now, their tiny feet tapping against the floor, their arms outstretched as they reached for her. She screamed, throwing her weight against the door, and finally, it flew open. She stumbled out into the night, her heart pounding as she sprinted to her car. She fumbled with the keys, her hands shaking as she unlocked the door and jumped inside. As she sped down the driveway, away from Ashgrove Manor, she glanced in the rearview mirror. The dolls were standing on the porch, watching her leave. Samantha didn't return to the manor after that night. She couldn't. The nightmares that followed were enough to keep her far away. But the dolls weren't finished with her. Every night, she would wake to the sound of tiny footsteps in her apartment, the feeling of something cold and lifeless brushing against her skin. And then, one night, she found it, sitting on her bedside table, staring at her with its unblinking eyes. A doll. One of her aunt's dolls. Its face was twisted into a grotesque smile, its hand reaching out as if to touch her. No matter where she went, the dolls followed. Because the dead don't rest. And neither do the cursed. Weeks later, a new owner arrived at Ashgrove Manor, curious about the strange property they had inherited from a distant relative. The house was just as Samantha had left it, silent, decaying, and filled with dolls. As the new owner explored the house, they noticed something strange in one of the rooms. A new doll sat on the shelf. A doll with dark hair and familiar green eyes. A doll that looked exactly like Samantha. Samantha Gray never expected to inherit anything from her estranged great-aunt Agatha. In fact, she hadn't even known much about her, other than the occasional whispered family stories about the eccentric old woman, who lived alone in a grand but decaying mansion called Blackthorn Manor, tucked deep in the English countryside. Agatha had lived a reclusive life, and over the years, the family had all but lost contact with her. But after Agatha's sudden passing at the age of 92, Samantha received a formal letter from a solicitor. Agatha had left her the entire estate, along with everything inside it. The letter was brief and formal, but there was one unsettling line at the end, be careful of what you find. Not everything in Blackthorn Manor rests easily. Samantha's curiosity was piqued. She wasn't particularly close to her family, and her life in London as a graphic designer had been feeling stagnant. The idea of inheriting a sprawling country mansion, even if it was falling apart, seemed like an adventure. Besides, she could always sell it if things didn't work out. A week later, Samantha found herself driving down a narrow, overgrown lane toward Blackthorn Manor. The trees pressed in from both sides, their branches casting long shadows over the road. As she rounded the final bend, the mansion came into view, a towering, gothic structure with ivy creeping up its stone walls and broken windows glaring like hollow eyes. The air around the estate was still and oppressive, as if the house itself was holding its breath. The front door creaked open when she pushed it, and the scent of dust and age washed over her as she stepped inside. The interior was as eerie as she had imagined, dark wood panelling, high ceilings with cracked plaster, and old furniture covered in white sheets. But what caught her attention immediately were the dolls. They were everywhere. Dolls on the shelves, dolls on chairs, dolls propped up in corners. Some were porcelain, their faces painted with delicate, lifelike features, while others were rag dolls with stitched mouths and glassy button eyes. Most were dressed in old-fashioned clothes, the kind children would have worn a century ago. There were dozens, 
no, hundreds, of them, scattered throughout the house. Samantha shivered. She had never liked dolls. Something about their vacant, lifeless eyes had always unnerved her, even as a child. But as the new owner of Blackthorn Manor, she would have to deal with them sooner or later. The first few days in Blackthorn Manor were quiet, but far from peaceful. Samantha spent her time exploring the vast house, dusting off furniture and sorting through the many antiques that had been left behind. Every room seemed to have its own collection of dolls, sitting in silent vigil. The strangest part was that no matter how many rooms she cleaned, the dolls always seemed to move. She would leave a room, only to return and find a doll in a different position or facing a different direction. At first, she tried to rationalize it, perhaps she had simply forgotten where she had placed them, or maybe they were shifting because the house was old and drafty. But as the days passed, the feeling of being watched grew stronger. On the third night, Samantha awoke to a strange sound. It was soft, barely audible over the creaking of the old house, but it was unmistakable, a faint tapping, as if tiny hands were knocking on the walls. She sat up in bed, her heart pounding in her chest. The tapping grew louder, more insistent, moving from one side of the room to the other. Samantha grabbed the flashlight she kept by her bed and scanned the room. The light flickered across the rows of dolls that lined the shelves. They stared back at her, their glass eyes gleaming in the darkness. One doll, in particular, caught her attention, a porcelain doll with curly black hair, sitting in a rocking chair near the window. She hadn't placed it there. The tapping stopped, and the room fell into an oppressive silence. Samantha's skin prickled with fear, but she forced herself to get out of bed and approach the doll. The rocking chair creaked as she reached for the doll, but before she could touch it, the chair began to rock slowly on its own. Her breath caught in her throat as the doll's head tilted slightly, its once fixed eyes now seeming to follow her movement. No, she whispered, stumbling back. This can't be happening. But it was. The dolls weren't just moving, they were watching her. Determined to understand the strange happenings, Samantha decided to investigate her great-aunt Agatha's life more closely. She hadn't known much about her before coming to Blackthorn Manor, but she hoped the house might hold some answers. She found an old trunk in the attic filled with papers, letters, journals, and receipts, but one letter, in particular, stood out. It was from a woman named Eloise, dated 1935. The letter was addressed to Agatha and spoke in cryptic terms about a collection and the spirits bound within the dolls. Eloise warned Agatha to stop her research into the occult, insisting that some doors, once opened, could never be closed. The letter sent a chill down Samantha's spine. What had Agatha been doing with these dolls? Had she somehow trapped spirits inside them? The idea seemed ridiculous, but then again, everything about the house defied logic. That evening, Samantha decided to explore the house more thoroughly. She had noticed earlier that there was one door she hadn't been able to open, a heavy oak door at the end of the second floor hallway. It was locked, and no matter how hard she tried, the key she found in her great-aunt's desk didn't fit. But now, with a sense of purpose, and dread, Samantha was determined to get inside. She retrieved a small crowbar from the basement and returned to the door. After several minutes of prying, the lock gave way with a loud snap, and the door creaked open. The room beyond was unlike the rest of the house. It was small, windowless, and cold, the air stale and thick with dust. In the center of the room was an ornate wooden table, and sitting on the table was the largest doll Samantha had ever seen. The doll was almost life-sized, dressed in an elaborate Victorian gown, its porcelain face painted with delicate features. But its eyes. Its eyes were different. They were dark, almost black, and they seemed to glisten with malice. 
Around the doll were strange symbols carved into the table, symbols that matched those Samantha had seen in some of the journals she had found in the attic, symbols associated with binding spells. A wave of nausea rolled over her as she realized the truth, Agatha hadn't just collected these dolls. She had been using them for something darker, something twisted. The spirits bound within them were not friendly. They were angry. Trapped. Suddenly, the door slammed shut behind her. Samantha spun around, her heart racing as she tried to open the door, but it wouldn't budge. Panic set in as she realized she was trapped in the room with the giant doll. The air grew colder, and the soft, tapping sound returned, this time louder, more insistent, coming from all around her. The doll on the table seemed to shift, its head tilting ever so slightly in her direction. Its black eyes gleamed in the dim light, and for the first time, Samantha noticed something horrifying, its mouth was slightly open, as if frozen mid-sentence. Then, to her horror, the doll's lips began to move. A faint whisper filled the room, a voice so soft it was almost inaudible, but Samantha could make out the words, Help me. Free me. The room grew darker, the air thickening with the presence of something malevolent. The other dolls in the house seemed to respond to the voice. Samantha could hear the faint sound of their glass eyes clicking as they moved in unison, turning their heads toward the locked room. The tapping sound grew louder, more frantic, as though hundreds of tiny hands were banging on the walls. Samantha backed away from the table, her breath coming in short gasps. She could feel something pressing in on her, something dark and ancient, like a malevolent force that had been lying in wait for years, now finally free. Suddenly, the giant doll on the table lurched forward, its hand reaching out toward her. Samantha screamed, darting toward the door, pounding on it with all her strength. But the door wouldn't open, and the walls seemed to pulse with energy, the tapping now deafening. The room seemed to spin as the shadows closed in around her. The dolls, hundreds of them, were coming alive, their voices joining in a cacophony of whispers, each one begging for release, for freedom. Let us out. Join us. Stay with us. In her panic, Samantha remembered the symbols on the table, the binding symbols. Agatha had used them to trap the spirits inside the dolls, but perhaps they could also be used to stop them. Desperately, she grabbed the nearest object, a piece of broken wood from the door, and began to scratch the symbols into the floor around her, mimicking the ones she had seen on the table. The tapping grew louder, and the doll's voices became more frenzied, but she didn't stop. As she completed the circle, the air around her seemed to shift, the pressure easing slightly. The tapping slowed, and the giant doll on the table stopped moving, its hand freezing in mid-reach. Samantha's heart pounded as she stood in the center of the circle, her body trembling with fear. The whispers faded, replaced by an eerie silence. For a moment, it seemed like she had succeeded. The dolls were still. The room was quiet. But then, the voice of the giant doll spoke again, this time louder, clearer, you can't stop us. We are bound to this house. And now, so are you. The walls began to creak, and the room darkened once more. The door burst open, and a rush of cold air slammed into her, sending her stumbling out into the hallway. She didn't look back as she ran down the stairs and out of the house, her breath coming in ragged gasps. Samantha never returned to Blackthorn Manor. She sold the estate to a distant buyer, leaving the house and its dolls behind forever. But even though she had escaped, the presence of the dolls still haunted her. At night, she would wake to the sound of soft tapping, just beyond her bedroom door. The last thing she did before moving away was write a letter to the new owner, a warning like the one she had received, be careful of what you find. Not everything in Blackthorn Manor rests easily. But she knew, deep down, 
that the dolls were still watching, waiting for the next person to set them free. Lily's grandmother had been the last link to her childhood. When she passed away, it felt like a chapter of her life had closed forever. The old house, nestled deep in the countryside, had always been a place of comfort, filled with memories of summer vacations and family gatherings. But now, it was empty, its halls silent, and the air heavy with the weight of loss. Lily hadn't been back to the house in years, not since she'd moved, to the city after college. When the will was read, she discovered that her grandmother had left her the house and all its belongings. It was a surprise, but Lily felt a strange pull to return, as if she owed it to her grandmother to go through the house one last time before deciding what to do with it. On a grey and rainy afternoon, Lily made the drive to the countryside. The house stood just as she remembered, with its weathered stone walls and overgrown garden. The windows were dark, the curtains drawn, and the whole place seemed to exhale a quiet loneliness. As she approached, she couldn't help but feel a sense of foreboding that she hadn't noticed as a child. The house no longer felt like a refuge, it felt like a tomb. The interior was musty, filled with the scent of dust and time. Lily wandered through the rooms, each one sparking memories of laughter, old photographs, and cozy evenings by the fire. But as she moved through the house, she noticed something strange, there were dolls everywhere. Dozens of them, sitting on shelves, on tables, and perched on chairs. Some were porcelain, others were cloth, but all had that unsettling, wide-eyed stare that sent a chill down her spine. Lily had always known that her grandmother collected dolls, but she didn't remember there being this many. They seemed to fill every corner of the house, watching her with their unblinking eyes. In her grandmother's bedroom, Lily found the largest collection yet, rows of antique dolls, each one meticulously dressed in old-fashioned clothing. Some looked brand new, while others were worn and cracked with age. The centerpiece of the collection was a large, intricately detailed porcelain doll seated on a velvet chair near the window. It was dressed in a faded blue gown, its face pale and serene, with dark, glassy eyes that seemed almost too lifelike. Lily shivered as she approached the doll. There was something off about it, something that made her feel like it was more than just a collection piece. A note lay in the doll's lap, written in her grandmother's delicate handwriting. Lily, my dearest granddaughter, if you are reading this, then I am no longer with you. You must be careful with the dolls, especially the one in blue. They are not as innocent as they seem. The doll maker's curse is real. Please, don't stay in the house after dark. Lily frowned, her skin prickling. She had never known her grandmother to be superstitious. What curse was she talking about? And what did she mean by the doll maker? Lily spent the rest of the afternoon sorting through her grandmother's belongings, trying to push the strange note out of her mind. But the dolls continued to haunt her thoughts. There were too many of them, and their eyes seemed to follow her wherever she went. As the day wore on, the house felt colder, the shadows lengthening as dusk began to settle over the countryside. She decided to take a break and rummage through the attic, hoping to find some old family photo albums or memorabilia that might explain her grandmother's fascination with dolls. The attic was cluttered with boxes, old furniture, and trunks that hadn't been opened in years. At the far end of the attic, hidden beneath a pile of dusty blankets, Lily found an old wooden chest. It was locked, but after a few minutes of searching, she found the key in her grandmother's jewelry box. The chest creaked open, revealing a collection of old letters and documents, as well as a tattered leather-bound journal. The journal belonged to her grandmother, and as Lily skimmed the entries, she began to uncover a story that sent chills down her spine. Her grandmother had once been friends with a man named Samuel Blackwell, a talented but reclusive doll maker who lived in the village. According to the journal, Samuel was not just a craftsman, he was an artist, 
known for creating the most beautiful, lifelike dolls anyone had ever seen. His work was so detailed, so exquisite, that people traveled from far and wide to purchase his creations. But as the years passed, Samuel became obsessed with his work. He started making dolls that were too realistic, with eyes that seemed to follow people and faces that seemed to change expression when no one was looking. Rumors spread that Samuel was using dark magic, that he had made a deal with a sinister force to bring his dolls to life. The village shunned him, and eventually, Samuel vanished. Some said he had gone mad and fled into the woods, while others whispered that his dolls had turned against him, trapping his soul inside the very creations he had made. Her grandmother's journal ended with a cryptic warning, the dollmaker's curse is real. The dolls are waiting, and they will not rest until they are freed. Be wary of the one in blue. Lily's heart raced as she closed the journal. The doll in blue, her grandmother had written about it in the note, and now it seemed connected to this strange and terrifying story. What had her grandmother been mixed up in? Just then, a sound echoed through the house, a soft creak, like footsteps on the floorboards below. Lily froze. She was alone. Wasn't she? Lily put the journal back in the chest and hurried down from the attic. The house was silent, but the sense of unease had returned. The dolls, with their glassy eyes and frozen smiles, seemed more menacing now, their presence oppressive. The sun had almost set, and Lily remembered her grandmother's warning, don't stay in the house after dark. But it was too late now. Night was falling fast, and leaving the house didn't seem like an option. A storm had begun to roll in, the wind howling outside and the rain battering against the windows. Trying to calm her nerves, Lily locked the doors and checked the windows, making sure everything was secure. She tried to settle in for the night, curling up on the couch in the living room with an old blanket, but she couldn't shake the feeling that she wasn't alone. The house groaned under the weight of the storm, the wind whistling through the cracks in the walls. But beneath the sounds of the storm, there was something else, a soft tapping, like the click of tiny feet on the wooden floor. Lily sat up, her heart pounding. The sound was coming from the hallway, just outside the living room. She grabbed her phone and turned on the flashlight, casting a beam of light down the dark hallway. There was nothing there? She let out a shaky breath, trying to convince herself it was just the house settling, or maybe an animal outside. But then the tapping started again, louder this time, and closer. It was unmistakable, the sound of something, or someone, moving. Slowly, Lily stood up, her flashlight trembling in her hand. She stepped into the hallway, her breath shallow as she scanned the shadows. The tapping stopped, but there was a new sound now, a soft, almost inaudible whisper. It was coming from the bedroom. Her grandmother's bedroom. The door to the bedroom was ajar, and as Lily approached, she could see the doll in blue, still seated in the velvet chair by the window. Its eyes, dark and glassy, seemed to catch the light from her phone, reflecting it like tiny mirrors. But something was different. The doll's head had turned slightly, just enough that it was now facing the door. Lily's blood ran cold. She was sure, absolutely sure, that the doll had been facing the window when she had last seen it. She stepped into the room, her legs shaking. The doll's face, so lifelike, seemed to watch her as she moved, its expression calm, serene, but with an edge of malice that hadn't been there before. And then, from the shadows behind the doll, came a voice. A soft, whispering voice, like the rustle of dry leaves. Help us. Lily backed away, her heart pounding in her chest. The air in the room grew colder, and the shadows seemed to shift and move, as if something was stirring in the darkness. She turned and fled down the hall, slamming the door behind her. 
She spent the rest of the night locked in the living room, listening to the storm outside and the faint, eerie whispers that echoed through the house. The next morning, the storm had passed, but the oppressive atmosphere in the house remained. Lily hadn't slept, her mind racing with the events of the night before. The whispers, the moving doll, it couldn't have been real. It had to be her imagination, right? But as she walked through the house, she realized something was wrong. The dolls had moved. They weren't in the same places they had been the day before. A porcelain doll that had been sitting on the shelf in the living room was now on the coffee table, its hands delicately posed as if reaching for something. Another doll, which had been in the kitchen, was now on the stairs, its head tilted at an odd angle, its eyes fixed on her. Lily's breath caught in her throat. How had they moved? She had been the only one in the house all night. Her mind flashed back to the journal, to the warning about the dollmaker's curse. Could it be true? Could these dolls be alive? The thought sent a shiver down her spine. She needed answers, and she needed to leave. But before she could even think about leaving, she had to know more about the doll in blue. Stealing herself, Lily went back to her grandmother's bedroom. The door creaked open, and there it was, still seated in the velvet chair, but its head had turned again, this time, facing her directly. Lily approached the doll, her pulse quickening. She reached out to touch it, hesitating for just a moment before lifting the doll's dress. There, carved into the base of the doll's porcelain foot, was an inscription. S. Blackwell. The doll maker's name. Suddenly, the air grew thick, and the room seemed to darken. The shadows lengthened, creeping toward her like a living thing. The whispering returned, louder now, more insistent. Free us. Lily stumbled back, her heart racing. She turned to leave, but the door slammed shut with a force that made the walls tremble. The dolls in the room, all of them, shifted, their heads turning to face her, their eyes glittering in the dim light. Panic surged through her, and she yanked at the door, desperate to escape. But as she did, she heard the unmistakable sound of tiny footsteps behind her. The dolls were moving. Lily ran, her breath coming in ragged gasps as she bolted down the stairs and into the living room. The dolls were everywhere now, their small, delicate feet tapping on the wooden floor, their glass eyes following her every move. She grabbed the journal from the attic chest, desperate for some kind of answer. There had to be a way to break the curse, to stop the dolls from coming after her. Flipping through the pages, she found a final entry, hastily scrawled in her grandmother's trembling handwriting. The dollmaker's curse binds the souls of the innocent to his creations. They cannot be freed until the dollmaker's soul is laid to rest. The one in blue holds the key. Destroy it, and the others will be freed. But be warned, the dollmaker will not let her go easily. The one in blue. Lily had to destroy it. She grabbed a fireplace poker and rushed back to her grandmother's bedroom. The door was ajar now, as if the house itself was daring her to enter. The doll in blue still sat in its chair, its expression as serene as ever, but the air around it was thick with malice. Without hesitation, Lily raised the poker and brought it down on the doll's head. The porcelain shattered with a deafening crack, sending shards flying across the room. But instead of stopping, the whispers grew louder, angrier. The shadows swirled violently, and from the broken remains of the doll, a dark, twisted figure began to emerge. It was the dollmaker. His form was barely human, more shadow than flesh, his face twisted with rage. His eyes burned with an unnatural light, as he reached out toward Lily, his voice a low, menacing growl. You cannot free them. They are mine. Lily stumbled back, her heart pounding in her chest. 
The dolls in the room began to move again, their broken faces turning toward her, their tiny hands reaching out to stop her. But Lily refused to give in. She grabbed the remaining pieces of the doll in blue and hurled them into the fireplace, watching as the flames consumed the porcelain, turning it to ash. The doll maker let out a horrific scream, his shadowy form writhing as the flames licked at him. The dolls around her froze, their glassy eyes dulling, their movements stilled. As the last piece of the doll burned, the doll maker's shadow dissolved into the air, leaving nothing behind but silence. The house was quiet now. The oppressive atmosphere was gone, and the dolls no longer moved or whispered. They sat, lifeless, their glassy eyes staring blankly ahead. Lily left the house that day, locking the door behind her and vowing never to return. The dolls remained, their curse broken, but their eerie presence a reminder of the dollmaker's twisted legacy. And though the house was abandoned, the locals say that sometimes on dark, stormy nights, you can still hear the faint sound of tiny footsteps echoing through the halls. Because the dollmaker's creations never truly die. They only wait. And they're always watching. For as long as she could remember, Claire had been fascinated by antiques. There was something about the history behind old objects, the way they carried stories of the past, that drew her in. Every weekend, she would visit estate sales, flea markets, and antique shops, hoping to find some hidden treasure with a unique history. It was during one of these weekend hunts that she stumbled upon the Dollmaker's Emporium, a small, dusty antique store tucked away on a side street she had never noticed before. The shop was packed with old furniture, clocks, trinkets, and shelves full of forgotten things, but what caught Claire's attention were the dolls. Dozens of them, lining the walls, their glass eyes watching her from every corner of the store. Most were delicate porcelain dolls, with intricately sewn dresses and painted faces frozen in placid expressions. There was something unsettling about them, but Claire couldn't tear her eyes away. An elderly woman emerged from behind the counter, her back slightly hunched and her eyes sharp as she observed Claire's interest. You have a good eye, the woman said, her voice raspy. These dolls are very old, made by a master craftsman, someone with a special touch. Who made them? Claire asked, moving closer to inspect one of the dolls. It had dark hair, neatly braided, with tiny, hauntingly lifelike eyes that seemed to follow her. The woman smiled, though the gesture didn't reach her eyes. The dolls were crafted by a man named Gideon Blackwood. He was a doll maker, one of the best in the world. But his story isn't a happy one. Claire raised an eyebrow. What happened? They say his work became... cursed. The woman's voice dropped to a whisper, as though sharing a forbidden secret. Blackwood was obsessed with perfection. He poured his heart and soul into every doll he made, creating each one as a reflection of human beauty. But after his daughter died in a terrible accident, his work took a dark turn. The dolls. They started to change. Claire felt a chill run down her spine. Change how? The woman shrugged, her fingers trailing along the edge of a shelf filled with dolls. People who owned Blackwood's dolls, said they moved on their own. They'd find them in different places than where they left them, their expressions would shift, and some even claimed the dolls whispered to them at night. Eventually, people stopped buying his dolls altogether, and the doll maker himself disappeared. Claire shuddered at the thought. As creepy as the story was, she found herself drawn to the doll she was holding. It had an almost magnetic pull on her, as if it was calling out to her. How much for this one? She asked, lifting the doll in her hands. The woman's smile widened, her eyes glinting in the dim light. For you, my dear, only twenty dollars. It was a bargain, but there was something unsettling about the way the woman watched her as she handed over the money. 
the transaction felt more like a transaction of fate than a simple purchase. But Claire shrugged it off. She had always loved a good story, and maybe this doll, haunted or not, would be the perfect addition to her growing collection. After bringing the doll home, Claire placed it on a shelf in her bedroom, among her other antiques. At first, nothing unusual happened. The doll sat motionless, its glass eyes staring blankly ahead, the eerie story from the shop fading into the background of her busy life. But then the strange occurrences began. The first incident happened a week later. Claire came home from work to find the doll sitting on her bed, perfectly positioned against the pillows. At first, she thought she had left it there herself and simply forgotten. But then, the next night, the doll had moved again, this time to her desk, its head slightly tilted as if watching her work. Her initial reaction was to laugh it off, assuming she was either imagining things or somehow moving the doll without realizing it. But as the days passed, the incidents became more frequent, and more disturbing. The doll would be in different places every time she came home, always positioned as though it had been placed with care. Sometimes its tiny porcelain hands would be raised, as if reaching for something, or its head would be tilted in a different direction. One night, Claire was awakened by a faint, soft sound, a whisper, barely audible, coming from the corner of the room. She sat up in bed, her heart racing, and glanced toward the shelf where the doll usually sat. It was gone. Her breath hitched as she scanned the room, her eyes finally settling on the desk. There, bathed in the pale moonlight filtering through the window, sat the doll, its head turned toward her, the glass eyes glinting in the darkness. Claire's skin prickled with fear. She knew for certain she hadn't moved the doll. But it wasn't just the doll's new position that frightened her, it was the distinct, unnerving sense that the doll was watching her. Studying her. She quickly turned on the light and, with trembling hands, picked up the doll and placed it back on the shelf. But sleep, didn't come easily after that. Every time she closed her eyes, she could feel the doll's presence, lurking in the corner, waiting for her to let her guard down. As the days passed, the strange occurrences escalated. Claire would hear faint giggles in the middle of the night, the kind of soft, childlike laughter that shouldn't have been there. Lights flickered in her apartment, and objects began to move on their own, books falling off shelves, doors creaking open, her phone sliding off the nightstand. But it was always the doll that scared her the most. One evening, she came home to find the doll standing upright on her kitchen table, its tiny arms raised as if reaching out for something. Her stomach dropped. She hadn't touched the doll since the last incident, she had even started locking it in her closet at night, hoping that would put an end to the eerie movements. But somehow, it was out again, standing in the center of the room as if waiting for her. Claire's heart pounded in her chest as she stared at the doll. This isn't real, she muttered under her breath. I'm imagining things. She grabbed the doll, her fingers trembling, and stuffed it back into the closet, slamming the door shut. She didn't care about her collection anymore. She wanted this doll out of her life. But no matter where she placed it, it always found its way back out. Desperate for answers, Claire called her friend Megan, who had a knack for research and was always up for a mystery. Megan agreed to come over the next day to help her figure out what was going on. When Megan arrived, they both sat at the kitchen table, the doll placed in the center. It's creepy, I'll give you that, Megan said, inspecting the doll closely. But haunted. I'm not so sure. I swear it moves on its own, Claire insisted. I've been hearing things, too. Voices? It's like. It's alive. Megan raised an eyebrow. Well, let's see if we can figure out where this thing came from. They spent hours researching the doll, and the story of Gideon Blackwood. The deeper they dug, the more disturbing the story became. 
Blackwood's obsession with perfection had driven him to experiment with dark rituals, using forbidden magic to infuse his dolls with life. He believed that by trapping souls inside the dolls, he could grant them eternal beauty and youth. But his experiments had gone horribly wrong. According to old newspaper clippings and journal entries they found, Blackwood's dolls were more than just haunted, they were cursed. The spirits trapped inside them had become vengeful, twisted by their confinement, seeking escape from the porcelain prisons that held them. Megan looked up from the computer, her face pale. Claire, I think this doll might actually be cursed. Claire's stomach churned. What do we do? I don't know, Megan admitted. But we need to get rid of it. Tonight? That night, Claire and Megan decided to drive the doll far out of town and leave it at an abandoned lot. They packed it in a box, sealed it shut, and threw it into the back seat of Claire's car. The plan was simple, dump the doll and never look back. As they drove through the dark, winding roads outside the city, the atmosphere in the car grew heavy. The radio crackled with static, and the headlights seemed to flicker, casting long, distorted shadows on the trees lining the road. Megan kept glancing nervously at the box in the back seat. It's like the air feels. Heavier. Claire nodded, gripping the steering wheel tightly. I know? It's been like that ever since I brought the doll home. Suddenly, the car's engine sputtered, and the headlights flickered off entirely. Claire slammed on the brakes, her heart racing. The car rolled to a stop in the middle of the deserted road, plunging them into complete darkness. What the hell? Claire muttered, trying to start the engine again. But the car wouldn't turn over. It was dead. Megan turned in her seat, staring at the box in the back. Claire? I think it's the doll. Before Claire could respond, a soft, rhythmic tapping sound echoed from the back seat. They both froze. The tapping grew louder, more insistent, as if something inside the box was trying to get out. Megan's eyes widened in terror. Claire, we have to get out of here. But before they could move, the box suddenly burst open. The doll, somehow free from the tape and packaging, sat upright on the back seat, its glass eyes glowing faintly in the darkness. The air inside the car turned ice cold, and a low, whispering voice filled the space. You can't leave me, the voice hissed. I'll never leave you. Claire screamed, throwing open the car door and scrambling out, Megan following close behind. They ran down the dark road, their breath visible in the freezing air, but the voice followed them, growing louder, more sinister. You belong to me? Desperate and terrified, Claire and Megan sprinted through the woods, the whispers echoing all around them. They could hear the soft crunch of footsteps behind them, as if the doll was somehow following, its tiny porcelain feet keeping pace with their panicked flight. They didn't stop running until they reached a clearing, the moonlight casting an eerie glow over the landscape. Claire's chest burned, her breath coming in ragged gasps, but she knew they couldn't stop. Not yet. What do we do? Megan asked, her voice trembling. How do we stop it? Claire's mind raced, trying to remember something, anything, from the research they had done. Then it hit her, Blackwood's ritual. The doll maker had used forbidden magic to bind the souls to the dolls, but the ritual was incomplete. The dolls could be destroyed, but only if they were returned to the place where they were first created. I know what we have to do, Claire said, her voice steady despite her fear. We need to take it back to where it came from. We need to find the dollmaker's workshop. Megan looked at her, her eyes wide. You're saying we have to take it back to that shop. It's the only way. The drive back to the dollmaker's emporium was the longest of Claire's life. Every mile felt like a lifetime, the air inside the car heavy with dread. 
The doll sat in the back seat, silent but ever present, its glass eyes reflecting the dim light of the street lamps. When they finally arrived at the shop, it was closed, the windows dark. But Claire knew they had to get inside. She pounded on the door, shouting for the old woman who had sold her the doll. After what felt like an eternity, the door creaked open, revealing the elderly shopkeeper. Her eyes flickered with recognition when she saw the doll in Claire's hands. I see you've found the truth, the woman said softly, stepping aside to let them in. Inside, the shop was dimly lit, the shelves lined with more dolls, each one seemingly watching their every move. Claire felt a shiver crawl down her spine. Please, Claire said, her voice desperate. How do we stop it? The old woman sighed, her eyes sad. The doll maker's curse is powerful. He bound the souls of the dead to these dolls, trapping them in a twisted form of eternal life. The only way to break the curse is to return the doll to the workshop where it was created. Burn it there, and the soul will be set free. She handed Claire a key, old and rusted. The workshop is in the back. But be warned. The curse doesn't let go easily. Claire nodded, her hands trembling as she took the key. She and Megan made their way to the back of the shop, where a small, hidden door led to an old, decrepit workshop. Inside, the air was thick with dust, and the walls were lined with half-finished dolls, their lifeless eyes staring blankly at the room. In the center of the workshop was a large, stone hearth, the ashes of a long-dead fire still inside. This is it, Claire whispered, holding the doll over the hearth. She hesitated for a moment, the weight of the curse pressing down on her. Then, with a deep breath, she threw the doll into the hearth and struck a match, tossing it onto the porcelain figure. The flames roared to life, and for a moment, nothing happened. But then, the doll began to scream, a high-pitched, inhuman wail that echoed through the workshop. The flames twisted and danced, and the air filled with a thick, black smoke. The voice, now filled with rage and desperation, whispered one last time, you can't. Escape me. But as the fire consumed the doll, the voice faded, and the air grew still. It was over. Weeks passed, and life slowly returned to normal. Claire no longer heard whispers in the night, and the strange occurrences that had plagued her apartment ceased. She and Megan tried to move on, though the memory of the doll and the cursed workshop lingered in their minds. One evening, as Claire was walking home from work, she passed by the street where the dollmaker's emporium had once stood. But to her surprise, the shop was gone. The building was empty, its windows boarded up, as though it had been abandoned for years. A chill ran down her spine. She never told anyone about what had happened in that shop, but deep down, Claire knew the truth. The dollmaker's curse had been broken, but the dolls were still out there, waiting for someone new to find them, waiting for someone else to make the same mistake. Because some secrets are never truly buried.